So um, it's great seeing you all today. Uh, I have spoken on every continent worth speaking on other than Antarctica. And um, I used to go speak all the time, but then this pandemic happened and I just started hanging out at the house and kind of forgot how to speak. So um, I have done one talk, two talks since the pandemic. So we're still on a trial run to see how this whole talking thing goes, you know, making sure I still have it. Um, but um, this, is a, this is a talk full of lessons and I just want to give you, start off with the lesson for you all. Um, you've done something good and some conference says, hey, you should come speak and you prepare your talk, you show up early, what do you do? And I learned this lesson and I almost forgot it this morning. Well, before you put your microphone on, go to the restroom, use it, and then put your mic on. <laughs> do not put your mic on and then go to the restroom. And I walked into the restroom this morning and I had the mic in my hand and I'm like looking at the mirror and I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. It's an amateur hour out here. So we, we started it off um, on, a, on a pretty high note here, um, but I forgot my mic. So if you see me do this, it's not me doing the Baltimore slide or anything like that. It's actually me going over here to move my uh, slides to the next one. So I wanted to do something a little different. Um, we talk about DevOps. I actually spoke at the 10-year DevOps celebration in Ghent, Belgium, so I am DevOps. How do I know? I'm in the book. I literally have the book. I am DevOps. I spoke on the stage in Ghent. I don't remember what I talked about because that was pre-pandemic, but I definitely spoke about something. But today I wanted to do something a little bit different. I wanted to expand your mind. We're in a historic building in a historic city with a interesting background, and it actually, if you're from D.C., an interesting current. Um, gentrification is real, and um, I'm not really a fan of it. But I wanted to talk about something that you all might not know about. And what I wanted to actually do is talk about how Dwight D. Eisenhower created DevOps. And I didn't put this little subtitle in my, um, in, in the, whenever I uh, emailed the organizer, because I wanted to have a little bit of intrigue, and you're probably thinking, what is Brian talking about? Um, but stay with me, I think you'll like this. So this is a talk, unfortunately, um, for the people of color and women in this room, um, just full of um, mostly dead white guys, but not all dead white guys. But trust me, I am going somewhere with this, and it's very, very important. Um, so you might know some of the people on these slides, and if you do, that's cool, but you might not know so many people on these slides. But I'm gonna start off, and I'm just gonna talk about history for a little bit. So there was this gentleman named Vannevar Bush, um, no related to the president's presidents, um, but um, this guy was very interesting. Um, he was super duper smart, and he was born, he was around during World War I, and what he thought of was, um, science -y things, things to help the government do things better. Um, one of the things he actually created was an analog differential equation solver that could use 18 variables. And I, wouldn't, I went to go find pictures of this because I wanted to see what that looked like. But really something that he was interested in was whatever this is. You all know what this is, right? It's a transistor. And this is very important. I mean, not it's not a transistor. This is a vacuum tube. What am I thinking of? This is a vacuum tube. Very important to this story. And one of Vannevar Bush's um, gifts to the world was airborne radar. And we have to actually understand that radar was one of the, you know, one of the, one of the um, Allies' greatest powers during World War II. It's one of the things that led to us winning World War II. It's not the thing, but it is one of the things. So the government's like, oh man, this Vannevar Bush guy, he's pretty smart, let's keep him around. But this Vannevar Bush guy, he was out in the community and he knew this guy named Frank B. Jewett. And there was this huge com company up in New York and it was called Bell. It was basically, it was AT&T. And the government's like, hold on, hold on, hold on. You all are way too big. We're gonna have to split you up, but we're gonna let you still be a monopoly and we're going to control that, but you can't be one country. One, one company anymore. So there was like AT&T, and then there was like a manufacturing arm, 
And then out of that came Bell Labs. And this guy, Frank B. Jewett, who's smart in his own right, said, we're gonna run this. And at first they were up in New York, and then they moved down to um, northern, New or kind of like mid-New Jersey. And then when we think about um, Bell Labs in New Jersey, this is the guy who pretty much started that. Um, and at Bell Labs, interesting enough, um, they created something called the transistor. Now, actually, they didn't create it once, they created it twice. And actually, they didn't create it because someone in Canada kind of created it before. But we have um, three people in this picture. We have John Bardeen, William Shockley, and Walter Breton. Breton and Bardeen created the first um, transistor for Bell Labs. Shockley's like, well, hold on here. I created it too. But he really didn't create it because he cribbed from the guy in Canada. Um, but they came together, and all three of them um, got a Nobel Prize for this. And why was the transistor so important? Well, um, there's a whole bunch of reasons, but we're computer people, so I'll just stick to something that we're familiar with. Well, it allowed them to create a computer that was made of transistors. And um, I'm old, but I'm not vacuum tube old. So I don't know what a vacuum tube computer sounded like. You know, ENIAC, um, all the huge ones that filled up a whole room. Well, they had to because, um, uh, because vacuum tubes were hot and um, you needed a whole bunch of them. But Bell Labs created Tradic. And what Tradic was was the first transistorized computer. And um, that led to um, this company called Digital Electronic Corporation creating something called the PDP-1. And this was like the, really the first usable one. And you're probably like, DevOps days, Brian. What in the world is this guy talking about? Trust me, this is only act one. But I need to, I need to lead you along to let you understand about hacking. So now that we're done with the first section, though, think about this. We, have, we think of ourselves as computer people, but there's this term, hackers, where people are hacking out things. Um, whenever you have Bush, you have Jewett, you have Bardain and Shockley, these were the original hackers. Before there was computers, these people were hacking on electronics. Think about what the world would be if we did not create the transistor. Um, we would have iPhones with vacuum tubes in them. So it'd be like carrying around, well, probably like a backpack, it'd be huge. Or maybe it wouldn't, maybe it'd be like a cart that you would take with you. But we needed the transistor, and the transistor um, delivered us. So back to our subject here, Dwight D. Eisenhower. He was in the military, smart dude. And you know how I know he was smart? He says, hey, I went over and we fought people all over the world, but you know what we needed, really? We don't need more soldiers, we need more nerds, really. And what um, Eisenhower actually put together is he's like, hold on, I need more scientists to run our government. I saw what science has brought with um, inventions like um, radar and sonar and all the other things during World War II. We need more of those people in our, in our country funded by the government. So he's like, oh, Bush. Let me bring Bush back. We like Bush. Um, sorry. Um, we like Bush. Let's bring him back in. And Bush was like, all right, you know what? We're going to create this thing, but we need people to lead it. And what happens, and if you're not from DC, so you probably will not respect this, but if you are, you will understand, is that um, no good idea is good enough to not fail a few times before you get it right. And what happened is um, they wanted to start this agency inside of the defense agency, and they were like, we're going to create this research thing inside of the government. And they, they brought in some people, and they failed. But then they brought in this guy, Lick. And Lick, first of all, if you can convince people to call you Lick with a smile on your face, <laughs> you are a serious dude. And Lick was that dude because what Lick said, when Lick started, there was no computer science. As a matter of fact, Lick is a psychologist. He's like, I'm gonna go to school and I'm gonna talk about, learn about psychology. And he did and he was like, and someone showed him this computing thing and he's like, hold on. I can use the computers to further my psychology. But as he started using computers, he was like, oh, no, no, no. These computers are the future. I want to be a part of it. And so what he ended up doing is working at an organization called ARPA. ARPA is very interesting. Um, the history of ARPA is, um, 
as interesting as anything else in DC. So um, DC is this part, but we're really close to Virginia and there's a lot of stuff over there, but it was swamp. And before the Pentagon was built, it was like a lot of swamp land and they weren't sure where to put things. Um, and, they, and they ended up building it. They weren't sure where to put ARPA. So the Pentagon actually is in the shape of a Pentagon. And it has multiple rings if you've never been in there. Actually, I've literally never been in it, but I, I know what it looks like. It has multiple rings. And depending on what ring you are in is how important you are. So um, it must have been, ARPA must have been pretty important because it, it got to like the D ring. So it was moving towards the center. So um, this was great. But why ARPA? Well, we need a way for the government to fund research into projects that make the country better. And because it was in the Pentagon, it was defense. It's like basically, um, I have $10 to blow people up. Can I only use five? No, I'm sorry, that's not really what it was for. It was really for um, thinking about how can the government provide more scientific um, discovery and how can we fund that? So you all know about ARPA. What did ARPA create? Well, it created ARPANET. And actually, Lick had a big um, influence on, on creating this thing called ARPANET. And whenever we think of ARPANET, we think of, we think of networks today, there are so many things. This is the picture of an ARPA network in 1969. There was um, some nodes in Utah. Um, there were some nodes out east. Um, there, was, there was something out east in um, Massachusetts. Um, but there was um, University of California, Santa, Berk, Santa Barbara. And then there was UCLA. And then there was SRI, which stands for the Stanford Research Institute. So you see where all this was. But why did they do it this way? Well, it's because the government bought all those computers and they wanted to connect them together. Well, why do they want to connect them together? Well, they realized that um, I have a computer here and I have a computer here. Time sharing had been invented, but wouldn't it be nice if I could time share across locations? So they were like, yeah, let's do that. So they built this thing. And um, because the government is, um, the government can't just go out and say we're going to do things. For big projects, they have to um, put out bids. And this company out of Massachusetts called BBN, um, they're like, we're gonna bid on this. But if you had known BBN before they applied for this ARPA contract, um, they did something else. They were an acoustics company. And you should go search up Carnegie Hall Failure Acoustics, BBN. And you see that they had one of the worst failures on sound and wasting money of all time. But they're like, you know what? We can do more than one failures at once. So they were like, hey, let's create some computer stuff and link these things together. And what they actually did is they assembled some of the smartest people literally in the entire world. And no, 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 I'm sorry, I shouldn't say it that way. They assembled some of the smartest white guys in the entire world. <laughs> and um, they got them together. And you know what? I'm not, I'm not diminishing anyone. These dudes were smart. These dudes were super smart. Like, there were no networking protocols. Um, you heard of RFCs? Everyone here has heard of RFCs? Like, if I say RFC 1918, what do you think? What'd you say? You know, our private addressing. Yeah, private IPs, you know, our 172s, our 10s, our 192, 168s. Um, these people created that. They created the first, they created the RFCs. And the first RFC is basically describing the ARPANET and the protocols they use. But I wanted to highlight one person, and he's actually up top in the middle. His name is Bob Kahn. Does anyone here know who Bob Kahn is? Yes. Bob Kahn lives across the river. Bob Kahn is part of DC. Um, but I, I bet you've heard of another guy that always gets the credit. Uh, we'll, oh, I'm sorry. That's the one after this. Um, so that crew from BBN created something called the M Interface Message Processor, which is the IMP. And the IMP was basically routers before they were routers. They invented the concept of routers and they sent them out, they sent them out west, they sent them out to other countries, uh, other places so they could create the ARPANET. But you know who gets um, credit for creating the internet? You've heard of Vint Cerf, haven't you? Everyone's heard of Vint Cerf. Do you know why you've heard of Vint Cerf and never heard of Bob Kahn? Um, well, they, they both created um, transmission control protocol together, but they said, well, you can't, both names can't be first on a paper, so they flipped the coin. And that coin toss actually made you know about Vint Cerf 
and Bob Kahn. But they created TCP and then later renamed it something called TCP IP together. Um, yeah, they were hackers. They hacked from nothing. And then um, there's this other guy, Tim Berners-Lee. He created something called the World Wide Web. You may have heard of it. Um, and then there's this other dude here, Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina. Mark Andreessen is on the left in this picture. Think about that. Mark Andreessen is on the left. Um, have you heard of anything that Mark Andreessen's done? Yeah, Andreessen Horowitz. So if we think about this, that because um, a president loved nerds, we basically end up with the World Wide Web and web browsers because these two people created NCSA um, Mosaic in Illinois. So that's the end of that chapter. But let's move on. So this is now the third chapter of hacking. So now ARPANET exists. Um, this, is a, this is a map from two years past the other one where basically we have ARPANETs going east coast to west coast. Um, these lines, these lines that they're drawn, these are like 56 kilobit lines that took many weeks for AT&T to procure. And just to let you know, AT&T was the hero during cre creating the transistor. ATT is totally the villain for the rest of the story. And why? <laughs> because AT&T says that there should be one way, and it is AT&T. So if we don't think it's a good idea because we created the transistor and the telephone service and all these other things, how could it be a good idea? And don't get me wrong, AT&T did a whole bunch of things. AT&T and Corning created fiber, you know, fiber optics. Think about that. Someone's like, you know what, I'm gonna shine a light through glass and it's gonna go under the water and it's going to work. And they did that. So they're amazing, but they're still villains at the same time. It's funny how that can work out. So we have this ARPANET thing. Um, and then um, we have this school up in Massachusetts. It's called MIT, you may have heard of it. It's a, supposedly a big deal. But uh, there was a group of people who enjoyed trains who went to MIT. And it was a tech model railroad club. And what was interesting about this group is not the trains, it's the people who were interested in trains. And these people come to find out who were interested in trains were also in interested in computers. So they had a computer, they had access to a computer like a PDP-6, they had this computer called a TX-0, and what they would do is they would use it when they could. Now, official company business and, and um, school business happened during the daytime, so they would be on there all night. And when I say all night, they might go 30-hour stretches, or they might just be on there from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m., and they just did not care. But the people who did this, um, they created some, thing, some interesting things. Um, if you're showing your age, this is way before my time, um, there's something called, uh, see, you never know what your slides are going to look like, but they created the first game. It was called Space War. And what they did in Assembler is they created some things for shooting, and, and they would actually have battles. And they created the first multiplayer games in the 60s. And you got to think that in the 60s, there were no personal computers. It was just teletypes. And, and, and basically, they created these things, and they had access to them, and they were able to have competitions overnight because important things happened during the day. But other things they did where they did a lot of hacking, and they were like, well, we can change Assembler, and we can do all these things. And this is how it affects the one woman who's in my talk. So this is Margaret Helmington. Um, you might know of her because um, she's shorter than a stack of books, but also because she did guidance stuff for the Apollo program, which sent people to the moon. And it must have been pretty amazing because we haven't sent anyone to the moon ever since. So Margaret Hamilton's still alive. Um, we should just treasure her for what she is because um, obviously our current people can't get it together. But um, the reason I put her in this story is because she was in computer science at the time, and what they were doing were rewriting binaries. They were rewriting things on the fly to make linkers faster, and they actually screwed her up in like messing up her calculations. Good thing this was pre-NASA time, um, so no one got hurt. But um, I just wanted to add that little tidbit to my story. So it wasn't just the East Coast. So the East Coast, uh, unfortunately, the East Coast is where things are created. The same thing for hip hop. It was created in the Bronx um, 50 years ago. And then it moved out West, and it was not 
better or worse. It was just what it was. And the same thing happened for the West Coast hacking. So we had the MIT hackers. They were in Tech Square on the ninth floor, and they just did all sorts of things. So all the hacker culture of picking locks and breaking into things came from these people. Do you know why? It's because they had this mindset, because this was the 60s, and I guess um, something in the 60s where everything should be free, everything should be open, everything should be for everyone. And you know what, um, I kind of agree, but then I'm like, well, not my stuff, maybe everyone else's stuff, but <laughs> you know what, I wasn't born in the 60s, so it doesn't matter. But we had three places in the 60s that were really interesting. We had um, Berkeley, where a lot of um, people were enhancing themselves and having really um, great thoughts. Um, we had people who were at um, Stanford doing more serious stuff, but still having really great thoughts. And then we had US, we had Edwards US Air Force Base out in the desert. And why do I put that in the story? Well, let me tell you why. Well, um, out there, because it was in the desert, you could launch rockets. And we did a lot of rocket testing out there in Edwards. Trust me, this is about hackers. Um, so there was these two dudes, um, Forrest Mims and Ed Roberts. So Forrest Mims, they were all doing that. They were doing these, um, this rocket stuff. And they were like, you know what? We're going to create a company where we're going to do rocket telemetry. And then they, they created this company called MITS, M-I-T-S. And they were like, well, you know, rocket telemetry is not really making the bucks. So then they were like, we're going to do calculators, because who doesn't need an $80 calculator? Because calculators, this is before Texas Instruments came and just killed the game. MITS was there first. Um, they were creating calculators. And they were like, you know what, you know what we really need to create? Um, there's this idea of a, of a typewriter with a TV. We need to create this. So what they created was the Altair 8800. And this is the first personal computer. Look at it. Actually, um, this picture has the, an optional um, expansion part. So let's look at the top one with all the lights on it. And Altair 8800 was the first personal computer. And it was so raw. It was so raw that they would actually just like, you would order it, and they didn't have the parts. So they would have to send the parts to you whenever they got them, maybe a year later. Um, and then um, there was no monitor. There was no keyboard. You see all those little switches on the front? This thing had 256 bytes of memory. 256 bytes of memory. What you would do is you would go in there, you would put the computer in a, in a, in a state ready to get the programs, and you would enter the decimal. You would enter the binary to run your program. And then if you were real quick, you could get the, you could get the response out. And they expect you to do that. How many people in here would have gotten computing had they had to flip switches all day? I mean, I probably would have because um, that's actually, I actually went and looked up one of these. They're kind of pricey. But this was like $3,000 back in 81. Whew. I, I don't even want to know. Um, so funny thing about um, the Altair 8800. Um, so at the same time where there was this Altair 8800, a bunch of nerds got together up near San Francisco, and they were like, we want to complain we want, actually, no. We want to talk about personal computing, but we also want to complain about um, Altair 8800. So they all got together. And um, one of the people, the person on the right here, Steve Wozniak, was one of the people who came to this, this homebrew computing club where they were going to talk about personal computers. And he was like, he was working at HP at the time, and he's like, oh, I got some ideas. And you may, you may have heard of Steve Wozniak, or you may have not heard of Steve Wozniak, but I think he had some good ideas after this. But also, um, this is, introduces Bill Gates to the equation. Bill Gates was in Harvard, and he had this friend named Paul. And they were like, we're smart, we're cool. Um, and what they did is they, they noticed the 8800, and they were like, well, there's no way to really interface with it or write programs at a high level without using Assembler. So they created something called Altair Basic. And they sold it, and they basically, they basically gave Altair the exclusive, or admits the exclusive rights to have this. But these hackers, these hacker people are like, software should be open, software should be free. So they just released the source code, and people improved on it. And Bill Gates was like, no, you should make money from software. And maybe he, you know, maybe he was right, and maybe he figured out actually how to make money for software. I've lost track of what he's doing these days. <laughs> but um, he was part of this story. But there's this other guy here named John Draper. Is anyone here familiar with John Draper? Um, Captain Crunch, not the... Um, not the other thing, not the food, but Captain Crunch. What John Draper did is what he has in his hand, you can't really see it, is this little blue thing. 
when he would take this little blue thing, he would go up to a, a phone, he would whistle into it and get free phone calls because AT&T, the real villain of the story, thought that you could use tones or they were using tones to be able to do long distance phone calls or any phone calls and he figured out how to do it. He also wrote a whole bunch of interesting software under other names, but because of this, um, this homebrew computing company and this Altair, he's a part of our story now, it's part of our history. He is a hacker. So um, people, other people are like, you know what, Altair is not the only thing. It doesn't even have a monitor. So we got other computers. We got the Soul Computer Terminal. We got the Commodore PET. We got the Trash 80. We got the Apple II because Wozniak was like, I can make computers as well. And this was great. And this led to, um, this led to another company uh, called Sun. And they're like, well, we can make the Sun One workstation. And I was like, that's kind of cool. And then we had other people IBM was like, hold on, well, we want to do desktop stuff for the people. And then this guy, Michael Dell, was like, in 1984, I believe, was like, hey, I could do computers as well. Remember when computers had turbo buttons on them? This is showing my age. You could like push it, it would make the computer run faster. Um, the Intel 8088 chip was amazing. But real quick sidebar here. So earlier, I was talking about AT&T being the villain. Um, there was a guy who could create the transistor named Shockley. He's like, I'm going out west, and I'm going to make my fortune. And he created this company, and um, what they were going to do was use transistors to create um, basically processors. Um, you might think this company was called Intel, but no, actually he made a mess, and he pissed a guy named Gordon Moore off, who was like, I could do this better. So Gordon Moore went and co-founded the real Intel, who created a processor. They were doing memory, then they did processors. They had the 4000 series, and then they had this... And then they had this um, 8000 series, but then they had this real thing, the 8088, and then they got the 8086, and then the 286, and the 386, and the 486, and now, I don't even know what they're called, but it's pretty amazing. Um, so yeah. So the final part of this story is, we got Bell here, they're the villain. Um, what they did is they got together with GE, and then they got together with MIT, and they created this thing called Multics. And Multics was, amazingly bad. Um, and this guy, Dennis Ritchie, who worked at um, Bell Labs, the villain, um, what he did, he's like, I can do better. So he created this thing called Unix. And that was pretty dope. I mean, it still is pretty dope. Um, but then this guy named Ken Thompson was like, got together with Dennis Ritchie, and they were like, hey, we need a better programming language. Um, so he said, we'll create C. But actually, they, C is amazing. C got us so far. Um, then, um, you were able to see more derivatives of Unix, so we had the HPUX, the X, and the, and the Solaris. And then um, there was this guy from MIT. Maybe MIT is the villain too, I don't know. Um, but this guy, Richard Stallman, and he was like, everyone is a fascist, everyone is a fascist, everything should be free, everything should be open. So he created a whole bunch of things, and you can say whatever you want about Richard Stallman, because I have a lot of words, but dude knew Lisp like no one. He created Emacs. He created also this thing called GNU. And here is the brilliance of this hack. This dude looked at all this software that existed in Unix and like, I'm gonna rewrite all that. And he rewrote all that. He did work of 10 hackers. Um, and then there's this guy, because now this story is, is, is global, um, this guy named Linus. Um, he's actually a great guy, actually. He loves diving. Um, he's like, hey, um, Multics was neat but I can create this thing called Linux, and um, it got us to the cloud, the end. Um, so um, <laughs> let's go back to my story here. And my premise is that Dwight D. Eisenhower created um, DevOps, and he did. He really did. Um, but actually, no, this guy named Patrick Dubois, he created DevOps. He created the name of DevOps. But we can't forget uh, my friend Andrew Clay Schaefer, who basically solidified a lot of these ideas that allowed all of us to be here today. And so, let me tell you my theory. Um, because Eisenhower was so great at looking forward, he realized that he needed smart people. Smart people got together and they said, you know what, we don't need rules. We will hack, we will hack, we will hack. We will create things that don't, that don't exist. Where things didn't exist, we will do the impossible. And because they did the impossible, we got things like the internet, web browsers, we got all the operating systems we learned. And we got these great big companies that we have now. But what we forgot is that the hacking is got what got us here. And we got, we got caught up in the bureaucracy. 
And then because we got caught up in the bureaucracy, we had to give things names, and we gave things names. We had these people, developers, and we had the operations. And because they had different names, they had different objectives. And what that did is it removed them from thinking about the hack. And if we get back to the hack, things will be better. So, in summary, Dwight D. Eisenhower created the Eisenhower Matrix. He created the US highway system. He created DevOps. Tell me I'm wrong. Ha <laughs> <laughs>